Welcome to the Unknown Webcast, and as always, in case you haven't figured it out, I am so conservative, I have trouble turning left even when I'm driving. This is broadcast number 23, and our guest tonight is our friend, Dr. Richard Howe. Our topic for this edition is of the Unknown Webcast is Caught Biological Fallacy. Uh, my name is Don Vino. I'm president of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. in Wonder Lake, Illinois, which produces the Unknown Webcast. And our senior researcher is Ron Hensel, who will introduce the sponsors of tonight's webcast. Ron. Well, greetings from hot, humid, but sunny Florida. Our sole sponsor tonight for the Unknown Webcast is World's End Theology Outlet, your one-stop destination for dubious doctrines, half-baked heresies, and other notions whose time has gone, World's End Theology Outlet. Well, we are back again. You know, every Monday we or Tuesday. What day is this? Anyway, every Today's Tuesday Tuesday. we end up here on this. So we don't we don't place. really care what you do every Monday. We're just concerned about Tuesday. I just got back from Orlando and as you know, we stopped at the only Portillo's restaurant in Florida. This is a major event in our lives. People are already asking us on Facebook, was it as good? And my son said it was 99% as good as the ones in Chicago because what's missing is the Chicago air that adds something to that's the one missing 1%. Otherwise, yes. Well, yes. Yeah. Well, so you, you know, you get to the point where you sort of don't trust air you can't see. So, yeah. It, it, how do you know it's there? So, greetings, Dr. Howe. Greetings. Thank you so much. And we're going to talk about informal fallacies. I take it that the formal ones are the ones that wear the tuxedos, and the well, informal ones. Well, I was going to say that that that's why I didn't want to talk about formal fallacies because my my tuxedo was in the cleaners, so I did I could only do informal. So I'm in the uh, so I stole shirt you. I, 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 I anticipated your your the uh, and and of course you know informal fallacies on the other hand are just tailor made for people. Uh, there we go. Are just tailor made for people who. <laughs> Who listen to Jimmy Buffett music and hang around uh, in uh, cut-off shorts and Hawaiian shirts, right? So Absolutely. that's why we're here. <laughs> well, well, you know, to, to, as I think about uh, fallacies, formal fallacies, informal fallacies, logical fallacies is kind of the overall theme that we're talking about today. Uh, I think most people don't really recognize when a fallacy has crept into an argument they just sense that something is wrong and they don't really know what it is or how to respond uh, so why is it important to understand what a fallacy is even a couple of things need to be that are relevant here I think first of all uh, the most obvious is that when fallacies are able to creep into an argument even perhaps inadvertently on the part of the speaker they can disrupt the flow of the argument such that a person will get diverted to something that's a say a false conclusion so in other words expecting an argument to carry them seamlessly from a series of premises to a given conclusion the fallacies are, are interrupting that that flow and so all of a sudden a conclusion that doesn't follow will seem like it follows precisely because a fallacy was occurred. It's also important, I think, for people, at least when you're looking at fallacies themselves, and it kind of makes us, it gives us better equipment to, to recognize them if we study them. I think a person needs to understand that there's a difference between formal fallacies and informal fallacies. And the difference basically is that, not surprisingly, a formal fallacy is a mistake in reasoning that breaks some formal rule of logic. So logic as a as a systematic discipline has a lot of rules. It's sort of like grammar in a way, according to which arguments are supposed to proceed. So if you violate one of these rules that are that formally define argument, then you're committing a formal fallacy. And, uh, and we, you, if you want to a, talk about give us a, an, uh, a, a short example of that. Yes, uh, probably one of the most common is an affirming the consequence fallacy. So it's a it's an argument fallacy committed when you're making an if then kind of argument. So if you said you know if it if it rains today the uh, the picnic is canceled 
and then someone says, well, the picnic is canceled, and they erroneously conclude, therefore, it rained today. Well, hmm. it doesn't follow that just because it rained, that the pic that, that uh, just because the picnic was canceled, that's why it was canceled on the basis of rain. So if right. it's true, if it rains, then the picnic is canceled. It doesn't mean if it's canceled, then it must have rained. That's called affirming the consequence fallacy. And so, so it when, breaks the formal rule. So when Woody Allen uh, proposed the syllogism, um, you know, um, all men die, uh, Socrates is a man, therefore all men are Socrates, uh, which, <laughs> was he committing <laughs> Well, yeah, it, uh, exactly. It, it, it's a formal or an informal fallacy. <laughs> that's a formal fallacy, and depending on how you write it out symbolically, you can make the same fallacy either because he's affirming a consequence or he's denying the antecedent. Now, they, unfortunately for the formal fallacies, they always have these real pedantic titles, unlike the informal, which are more, more interesting to study because those are the ones we run into more often, and just to get it out onto the table... A an informal I, fallacy. Uh, ahead, I guess I? I guess my favorite form. Oh, I was going to say my favorite name for a formal fallacy is the undistributed middle, because you know that just it, it almost sounds like a joke. I'm sorry, that's the fallacy of the undistributed middle. It's like, well, where was I supposed to distribute this middle? Right, I'm and distributing course, everything to the middle, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, my middle yeah, is very. Once you get in your. Yeah, yeah. Once you get in your 60s, you have more and more problems with the undistributed middle. Yeah, you've got when it comes to syllogistic logic like that, you've got undistributed middle and and uh, 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 illicit major, illicit minor, and these kind of things. So yeah, same same ideas because they're breaking formal rules of the grammar of, of formal logic itself, which is different than the informal stuff that I think we're going to probably spend the bulk of our time discussing. So so both can both Formal and informal fallacies be difficult to spot for the average person, or is one easier to spot than the other? Hmm. I, I think they're both difficult to spot, uh, and in a sense, uh, either of them, because they're fallacies, are still going to wreak damage and havoc on an argument. So it's not like, well, gee, if if you're going to commit one, at least commit this one, uh, you know, either formal or informal. They both are bad. They're just bad for different reasons. But the difference between them has to do with, with what it is to which we direct our attention in order to isolate what the fallacy is. Because in order to point out what a fallacy is formally, we have to look at the form of the argument irrespective of the content of the premises. That's why you can use P's and Q's like algebra to illustrate formal fallacies. But informal fallacies depend pretty much a hundred percent on the content of the premises themselves in, in the context in which the argument was given. So, as we'll, we can get into this later, but you could take an informal fallacy that someone commits and take that exact same form and change the content and it wouldn't be a fallacy anymore. It, it just hmm. depends on how it functions. And so since it depends entirely on the sort of context of discourse. That's why they're so common, because they occur in just, you know, political campaign ads and sermons and commercials and co everyday conversation, because pe people are just talking normally in context with content. So what you're saying is you can keep the form uh, in, in an informal fallacy, but if you change the content to make it, make it not a fallacy anymore, then you have reversed it. It's no longer an informal fallacy. It's, Absolutely. It's, yes. So, it, it, may, it may not be. Once you change the content of the premises, then it may very well not be fallacious uh, in a given situation. It just, it just so depends. It formal, so, go ahead. Go ahead. Is it an informal fallacy to say that um, the, uh, the, uh, the nominee's wife plagiarized her uh, uh, her speech, therefore her husband shouldn't be elected president. <laughs> this seems to be... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that's definitely what they call a non sequitur. Uh, you know, so, uh, okay. I, I hope somebody does, does some follow. research. I think it would be interesting if people did research to see if anybody before Michelle Obama had ever used any of those phrases like work hard for what you earn and well, see if I, maybe or not they could... You know. <laughs> I, I, oh, you I, mean that was not an original idea with her? I've got I don't Benjamin know. Franklin said a few of those. 
<laughs> well, here's the thing. I mean, uh, I was surprised at how quickly people came out of the woodwork to find uh, places where just about everybody uh, and their mother had plagiarized somebody during some campaign. Uh, so uh, w do you, for fun, uh, just watch uh, political conventions just for the informal fallacies? I mean, that Except alone. for the fact that if I'm not there to get into the argument personally, then I usually get frustrated just watching them on TV because I want too much to be a part of the uh, of the argument in order to point out the fallacies. But you know, you, you mentioned something a while ago about people, uh, our ability to sort of detect these things and learning how to detect them, something to that effect. One of the things I warn my students about is what, what I call the, the med school syndrome, like going to med school. And, and, and I had a friend, uh, probably all of us have known people who have gone through med school. And so through your study of medicine, you begin to look at the symptoms of diseases as you're reading your medical textbook. Well, if you're not careful in med school, you might start thinking everything is a symptom of some disease. You think you've got every disease as you read the symptoms. So what <laughs> I discovered with students when I tried to teach them to look, look at fallacies, then almost everything everybody said they thought it had to be some fallacy somewhere. And I go, no, it's possible to have normal discourse. Like, for example, it's possible to have a, a completely fallacy-free discussion that's still very impassioned with emotion. So just because, let's say, a person has a lot of emotion, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that they're committing some kind of, uh, that they're using the emotion as a surrogate for reason and a substitute for reason. Uh, uh, you know, just because you appeal to someone's pity doesn't mean you're creating or committing the appeal to pity fallacy. Or just because you appeal to an authority, these are all names of informal fallacies, doesn't mean you're committing the appeal to authority fallacy. And just okay. because you talk about a slippery slope doesn't mean you're committing the slippery slope fallacy. Well, you, that's, let's start with one of those. I, I, I'm going to latch on to the uh, uh, appeal to authority fallacy. Which is, if I understand it, the fallacy involved there is because I have this authority who said it's true, therefore it's true. Is that how you would summarize the yeah. fallacy? All right. This is good. This is a good example because it actually highlights another issue that's relevant here, and that is the difference between whether a premise follows from. I'm sorry. Whether a conclusion follows from a set of premises. That's one thing. The second is whether the person giving the argument is credible, is believable. So while, while it might be the case that just because an authority says it, that's not what makes it true, but it might make it reasonable to believe that it's true because an authority said it. And that's a subtle difference. But so a lot of times people are making arguments and the person will attack them as if they meant to say, well, because this authority said it, that's what makes it true. For example, if an astronomer tells us what the speed of light is, well, because he's an, or a physicist, as I say, because he's a physicist and he says the speed of light is 186,000 miles a second, well, the, the physicist is saying that is not what makes the speed of light 186,000 miles a second, obviously. But it might make it reasonable to believe by somebody who's not a physicist if he knows this is a bona fide authority. So the idea of the appeal to authority fallacy is when someone appeals to an authority that's not a legitimate authority in the issue under discussion. That's what makes it a fallacy. Okay. So like we, in, in apologetics, we find ourselves appealing to authority in quite a few situations. For instance, in establishing the meaning of a Greek word, we might appeal to even more than one lexicon. These are all authorities. Uh, are we simply establishing the credibility of our, if, if, if all four lexicons agree that this is what this Greek word means, uh, in this particular context even, are, uh, are, are all we doing is establishing the credibility of our position or have we maybe given some really solid evidence for its truth. Well, the the trick there about things like lexicons and, and words is that words better, generally have usage so that when a lexicon says that a, a word means X, Y, and Z, the lexicon says that because that's how the word actually is used either exclusively or almost always. So it is a sense in which it's not that way because the lexicon says it. Okay, fine. 
But the people that put lexicons together presumably are researching a language to see how is this word actually used. And mm -hmm. so it, it is evidence because if that's how the word is used and then if someone wants to insist it means something different, you say, well, then the burden is on them to go, well, why should we think it means something different than the way it actually is used in this language, let's say, you know, the Greek New Testament, for example. Right. Okay. So uh, when is an appeal to pity not a fallacy, for example? Can you give an example? Yes. The subtlety is that when someone appeals to pity as a, as a means of arguing that uh, what course of action should be followed is the moral course of action or an obligatory course of action. I think that's a fallacy. So, for example, if you know the students felt real sorry for the janitor at the school because he was living hand to mouth, and so somebody wanted to say, hey, I, I think we should take up some money and buy him a Christmas present. Okay, well, that's fine, and you can appeal to people's quote-unquote pity to say, hey, you know, he's got four kids, they, they don't ever get toys, and you can paint this this pitiful scenario as a way of getting people to see, hey, would you like to do something about it? That's all fine. But if somehow you tried to say, because of that, you're obligated to give to this guy, as if somehow the moral obligation arose precisely out of the feelings of pity that everybody had, that doesn't follow. So, yeah, you want to appeal to pity to get someone to motivate them to act a certain way, that's fine. But to get them to, to conclude that a certain thing is true about reality, that's a different matter. It may or may not be true, but it, if it is true or if it's not true, it won't really have anything to do with the pity that I'm feeling. My motivation to act may be, have something to do with the pity, but not the truth or falsity of reality itself. Hmm. Reminds me of a scene from a Quentin Tarantino movie, but maybe I shouldn't talk about that here. Yeah, uh, there's a movie called family Red. friendly, don't we? <laughs> Yeah, well, it was a, a fallacy, actually. <laughs> so, there was a scene, scene from the movie Reservoir Dogs, where they're at a restaurant, and um, they were. It was time to to uh, somebody was covering the bill, but they were all going to share the tip. And one of the guys there says, well, "I don't tip, I don't tip waitresses." And they're arguing with him. They uh, basically they're making appeals to pity. They're saying. Um, don't you, don't you realize how little these waitresses make? And you know, and he comes back with saying, "Hey, they can go get a job somewhere else that makes more money." It's like I didn't tell them to be waitresses. <laughs> so he wasn't he wasn't moved by the appeal to pity for some reason. Of course, he's a mobster too. So, you know, he. <laughs> so Don, what do you have to say about all this? Well, you know, as I think about this, and I, I shared this before we really started. Uh, uh, we don't always understand the name of particular fallacies, whether they're formal, informal, uh, and so sometimes Joe and I just sort of make up names for them because <laughs> it makes sense to us. Uh, and so one of them uh, we we talked about uh, is uh, what we call the sun is yellow excuse. Now, when we describe that, everybody understands what it is that's happening. You'd be talking with, say, a Jehovah's Witness on something like the physicality of the resurrection which they deny and and as is often the case when you're talking with someone like a Jehovah's Witness when they reach a point where they can't make any kind of defense they throw up this but the Sun is yellow which is true but has nothing to do with the topic we are discussing uh, and it serves as a sort of a distraction now is that a Can red herring know? or is that just a distraction or how, what, what happens yeah, with that? I, I think it is a, a very, very truncated red herring. Typically, red herrings uh, are a stream of premises to take you more and more oblique to the issue at hand. But even saying something that's uh, it's especially effective when what you say is itself uncontroversial, con uncontrover uh, con controverted. So to say the sun is yellow is not something they're going to get an argument from, right? So, right. yeah, they throw up this complete irrelevancy. In fact, it's, I like this, and I like the sun is yellow name that you've given it. I've actually seen this fallacy committed very often in political discourse, where in the middle of an argument about some complex political thought, somebody brings up an entirely irrelevant, but maybe true and uncontroversial political point. And to the unwary listener, it may sound like, oh, well, then I guess the point doesn't carry. You go, wait a minute, that... My point stands or falls, even if the sun is yellow. 
Right, because they're not connected. Because <laughs> they're not connected. The total well, you can throw the. And you could throw them off by saying, well, that's why I'm right, because the sun is yellow. You know, it's like it, it, it relates just as much to my premise as it does to yours. What yeah. if you were to – what is your – in terms of what is the uh, – I mean, we let's all get to the real reason why people, why people are watching us right now. Uh, what is the easiest informal fallacy to get away with? I mean, that's what everybody wants to know. If you're going to – if you're going to wow. violate the rules of logic – uh, you might as well, you know, do it in a way that's going to lead to success. You want to be a winner. You want to, you want to make America great again, or whatever it is you yeah. want to do. <laughs> well, last night we wanted to make America safe again. Okay, so you want to do something, and you don't care, you know, how many laws or rules or, you know, uh, in, immovable objects or irresistible forces you violate on your way to doing it, which would you pick as being the easiest informal fallacy to commit? I think probably, and this is probably why it's one of the most common, is is when you do an ad hominem fallacy. There's oh, a difference yes, between an ad hominem fallacy. There's a difference between an ad hominem fallacy and an ad hominem argument. But typically you can really sway people to believe something different than what they ought to believe based on the real evidence if you can somehow impugn the character of whoever is advancing the opposite point of view. So rather than getting in, say, and this happens a lot in, 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 in almost any context, rather than getting into what might be a little heavy lifting in terms of whatever the issue is, whether it's e the economy or other political issues or, or, or foreign affairs or whatever, if you could somehow just throw in, well, after all, you know, she beats her dog kind of comment, then it, it has – here's the thing that's so – that's so uh, insidious about these kinds of fallacies is it's not even that they persuade people cognitively it's that people will tend to mistake a, ple a certain emotional tug for being a cognitive persuasion so when you throw out these invectives against a person's character that are irrelevant to the point but you actually make people feel animus towards that person then they actually start thinking whatever that person is saying is false that's what makes it a fallacy you go, well, they could be, Satan could say something that's still true. I mean, if he says 2 plus 2 is 4, it's 2, two plus 2 is still 4, even if Satan is saying it. It doesn't make it false just because Satan says it. Ah, so, like, so to, to, um, to clarify this for our listeners, an ad hominem in Latin means an argument to the man or against the man. You know, in other words, you've right. made him the point, or his character the point of everything, when in fact the question is really, for instance, um, the, the point might be that, uh, okay, Jimmy Carter claims he saw a man-eating rabbit swimming toward his boat, and he needed to clobber it with a with a, an oar paddle. Now, this is a, this actually did happen, you know. I'm, uh, so now, uh, <laughs> the argument against this, of course, is that he's a Democrat. And, you know, uh, Democrats are constantly seeing man-eating rabbits everywhere they go. Of course, you know, they don't. So uh, that's a fallacy, but it's uh, but it's sometimes arguing to the man or arguing it to the point of the person's character isn't a fallacy, right? Correct. And where it, when it's not a fallacy, usually it has to do with the issue of credibility. This is why, for example, uh, a, a cross examination they can bring up the fact that the person on the witness stand is a felon. Is the, all the logicians don't jump up and go, oh, ad hominem fallacy, just because he's a felon doesn't mean what he's saying is false. Well, everybody agrees him being a felon doesn't make the facts different than what they are. But him being a felon goes to his credibility as a witness. So it's – and it may be subtle sometimes as to, well, when is it really relevant to credibility? The, the key there is if I bring up some point about my opponent – as if somehow this point about the opponent is what changes the facts in external reality, then that's typically going to be a fallacy. Well, I, right. I have, I have, I have an, up. Go ahead. I, I have an example uh, of a, a, a false teacher that managed to get into 30,000 churches across 60 denominations with a weight loss program because it was viewed as a, a women's Bible, a women's, a women's uh, uh, event, let's say, a women's program in churches. 
uh, and uh, she would be teaching on weight loss and how important it is to uh, to be physically healthy, watch your weight, get good exercise, all good things, nothing wrong with those. Um, and then she would go off and say, uh, but you never hear this being taught at the churches because they're trying to keep you dependent on them and by the way Jesus never claimed to be God. So, <laughs> so <Sorry. laughs> well, that's exactly what she did. Uh, and so what you discover is in the gospel God hates fat people. Uh, you have to be thin to win salvation. Uh, so she's committed this ad hominem because she's attacking the church for not teaching what she's teaching. You never hear this in church. Well, actually, there's a reason you don't hear it in church, because it's not taught in the Bible. Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, it's almost another one. Yeah, the sun is yellow. I mean, uh, she she's bringing up totally two totally unrelated uh, claims as if somehow they are logically connected to one another when they're not. And if one of the two things that are lo not logically connected but people think they are is persuasive, then the other kind of comes along because it's hitchhiking on the inertia of the first one. And people sort of, the second point sort of skulks in on its own, uh, hitchhiking <clears throat> on the front, on the original point that was the persuasive one. Uh, yeah, ab absolutely. I have an opinion about and maybe it's right or wrong, I don't know, maybe it's just my, a reflection of my own experience, but when getting involved in uh, not even really very complex uh, disagreements with people, I find the one fallacy that it's most easy for people to fall into and yet hard for them to see, and it can be difficult to, to, to demonstrate to them that they're committing it, it's, it's the fallacy of basically begging the question, or uh, petitio principi, is that how you would call it in Latin? Um, it's, That's uh, right. So it's, it's, in other words, um, they are assuming the correctness of their or original premise in their conclusion. Is that a good way of putting That's it? Right. That's right. It's, a, it's also called a circular argument. You know, right, like okay. the old joke that, that went around where, where the guy says, uh, hey, did you know that uh, Don Vino talks to angels? And so I says, well, how do you know that? Well, Don told me that he talks to angels. Well, how do you know Don's not lying? Well, would a guy that talks to angels lie? Same thing. So he's, <laughs> right. he, you're using a conclusion as part of the argument for the conclusion. Yeah, it's an informal fallacy. Now, what's been bugging me down through the years is uh, this one episode of the cartoon version of George of the Jungle. Okay, this is serious now. Uh, George, <laughs> George, <laughs> George refers to this magic stick he has that keeps polar bears away. Now, his gorilla friend, who is much more intelligent than George is, um, says, but George, there aren't polar bears for a thousand miles from here. And he said, see how good it works? Would that Absolutely be an no, example? It's a circular <laughs> argument. Okay, I just wanted to make it's sure. It's a circular that argument. It's been, been yeah. bothering me for decades. <laughs> yeah, it also could be the fallacy of uh, of the uh, false cause, where you where you state a thing but you state the cause incorrectly without establishing the causal relationship between the two. But yeah, that's a that's another. In fact, it's funny because a lot of jokes that we laugh at often play off of these kinds of informal fallacies and, and grammatical issues and other kinds of logical conundrums uh, where, where, where misplaced modifiers and things like that are circular reasoning and, and we laugh at them thankfully. Uh, too bad it wasn't that it wouldn't that all of them were so funny that we'd see them coming a mile away. Yeah. All right, yeah. and we are going to go to a short break. Ron is going to talk uh, to us from uh, our, a word from our sponsors. Okay, well, we uh, we have a new product from World's End Theology Outlet that you really need to know about. They're presenting it to us this week. Uh, do you have a hard time saying no to people? Uh, have you taken on too many commitments? Uh, are you just plain tired of always trying to please everyone? Well, then, friends, you need No True Scotsman Alibis and Excuses. This is an amazing product. It will help you out 
of these difficult jams. Let me show you a little bit about how it works. Let's say your wife says to you, honey, let's go to church. Well, with no true Scotsman alibis and excuses, you can have at your fingertips a ready response. You can say to her, no true Scotsman would go to a church where they don't sing a cappella. Well, let's say, for instance, your wife says to you, let's join a Bible study. Well, with this product, you can respond, no true Scotsman would attend a Bible study that's not based on the Geneva Bible of 1560. But we mentioned alibis, too. So let's say your wife said, honey, where were you when the pastor came visiting? Well, you can simply respond, no true Scotsman would miss a sale on pipe tobacco at Walmart. No true Scotsman, alibis and excuses. Operators are standing by. Collect calls are not accepted. This offer is not available in England, but it is available at World's End Theology Outlet. All right. Now, um, for, for our guests at home who want to know what value the no true Scotsman alibis and excuses, uh, and, and I understand it can be used for a lot more than alibis and excuses. You could use it in an, in an argument um, that you're trying to win. Uh, how, how would you use this? And what are you doing when you're using it? <laughs> well, uh, we, we keep coming up with some great examples here, so uh, you're stumping me on how some of these might be labeled. That, that sounds almost <laughs> like a the sun is yellow thing. I mean, no true Scotsman would do this. Well, who's going to who's going to quarrel with what the true Scotsman uh, uh, would or wouldn't do? So the sun is yellow, and no true Scotsman would do this. Well, yeah, but what well, does that have to do with the? You're you're basically <laughs> just taking it upon yourself to define who is a true Scotsman, and who isn't, right? You're you're uh, so basically you're saying. No matter what you say, I'm not going to accept that this is a true Scotsman if, if, if he's doing X, Y, Z, or whatever. I, I'm, I'm actually looking through my own list of uh, informal fallacies here, and I'm not sure where it falls. It, it's because, kind uh, of like a uh, special pleading fallacy, too. Uh, yeah. There's kind of different varieties of it, but when you, uh, it's sort of like saying, well, uh, when, when somebody, let's say a, some cult member says something about uh, what they do or believe, and you say, well, so and so said this. Here's your authority that said that. Well, they weren't a real, they weren't a real Jehovah's Witness or whatever. And they have to be careful because you can sort of define your position into existence by continually qualifying what counts as a true or false example of the thing. <laughs> So you have to back up. Okay, you set the standard as what a Scotsman is, and then we'll decide whether they do or don't use something later than the 1560 uh, Geneva Bible. I think I think some people would say the, what ends up happening with the no true Scotsman fallacy is the only true Scotsman left is the person using the fallacy. You know, ultimately he's the only one left who can be considered now, a true Scotsman. Uh, an another fallacy that I think is very common. Uh, is a poisoning the wells. Uh, when, okay. uh, in anticipation of something your opponent is about to say, in a debate, let's say, for example, you plant in the hearer's mind some prejudice, and then from that point forward, whatever he says is, is interpreted in light of that planted prejudice. Uh, now, I heard an example of this that I actually I thought was just hilarious. I still think it's a fallacy, but I thought it was so effective because this Christian used it on a Christian television show uh, in anticipation. What happened was is somebody was uh, going to set him up for something about the problem of omnipotence. You know, he was, so he asked the Christian, well, can God do anything? And then presumably the, he's expecting the Christian go, well, yes, he can. And then he would come up with a counterexample. So when he said to the Christian, can God do anything? The Christian said, well, there's two things God can't do. He cannot lie, and he can't do stupid things. <laughs> like <laughs> now, like, <laughs> like make a rock too heavy for him to pick up, for example. So no matter how, no matter how effective that would have been, once once he planted in everybody's mind, well, God can't do stupid things, and so the atheist goes, well, can God make a rock too heavy for him to pick up? It's totally evacuated of all of his rhetorical force because it just sounds like one of those stupid things that the Christian said, well, yeah, well, God can't do stupid things. Well, well, my answer to that, I, I've come up with an answer. I used to have another answer, but I don't use it anymore. The answer I use now is, you know, he cannot create a rock that's too big for him to pick up, and that's what proves his omnipotence. And like they would come, And they would come back and say, well, how does that prove his omnipotence? Well, because he is capable of producing bigger 
and bigger and bigger rocks, and yet he's still capable. No matter how big he makes it, he can still pick it up. So only an omnipotent being could do that, C create a rock that goes on and on and on, theoretically to infinity, and he still can pick it up. Can you think of? Uh, now, he's most well, now, omnipotent. Now, you, you were you were you were uh, talking about political discussion a little earlier, and and how that some of these things work, and the one you were just talking about uh, uh, with God doesn't do stupid things. Would Reagan's comment in the first time he ran, when people were going to try to make his age a problem, and he looked at <laughs> Mondale, I think. Uh, Mondale, Mondale, yes. M Mondale, and he said, uh, "I know some would want to make age an issue in this election, but." I won't hold your youthful inexperience against you. Is, is that how that <laughs> well, kind I think of works? I, listen, I think it's fair to to use these tactics as a preemptive strike against what is about to be a tactic in and of itself. Right. Because if Mondale wanted to bring up the specter of Reagan's age, that already is itself uh, an ad hominem fallacy because it's irrelevant to his. Uh, his beliefs, political beliefs. So, hey, you know, what, what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. If you see an opponent about to introduce an informal fallacy and gain a rhetorical uh, leverage, then if you can preempt that with your own, what people may say as a fallacy, hey, you know, so all bets are off. If he's going to throw one at me, I'm going to preemptively try to try to preempt it with my own. Right. So, so it effectively diff diffused the use of that against Reagan in a humorous way. Absolutely. That's exactly right. I think it was very, very, very clever. Yeah, absolutely. So now another um, fallacy. Here's a I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, you know, we're all, you know, uh, fallacies are really a very good source for people who are worried that uh, the, the end is near uh, and that we, we have to do something about it. Okay, uh, so for example, what uh, does this sound like a fallacy to you? Because I think it might. Uh, we have not been, um, we've not had a major planet-killing asteroid hit us in 35 million years. That's the good news. The bad news is we're due. So we're about, to, we must be about to be hit by one. Uh, does that sound like the gambler's fallacy to you, or an, ex or an uh, example of it? Well, it, it, I don't know if it's a gambler's fallacy because if you're talking about an event that is predicted to occur within a uh, window of time, <clears throat> excuse me, a window of time, and as that window of time draws to the close, it would seem reasonable to expect the event more and more. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the case that the thing would happen within the window of time in the first place. Well, how can you predict uh, an event where you don't have the identity of the object that's going to hit the Earth? You're, you're simply assuming that there is one out there, and it is must okay, be heading that's away. The case. That's true. So if those kind of things were in place where he's building an argument based on ignorance, something that he doesn't know, then yeah, absolutely would still be a fallacy. I was just granting the truth of the original premises that if there was this asteroid that is, is supposed to hit us about every 30,000 years, let's say, oh, and it no, hasn't done no. it yet. Yeah. I'm sorry, I must have misstated I, yeah. the premise. Yeah. Well, you, you so, have this kind of in the, in the whole climate change discussion, uh, it seems to me, where you have... Uh, uh, appeal to authority, for example, Al Gore says, quote unquote, who's not a, a climate <laughs> scientist. Uh, no. uh, but he created the, the internet, so. so. He created it, and, and Love Canal. <laughs> uh, that it was about him. Um, and uh, New York will be flooded by 2015. Oh yeah, they missed that one sort of. Um, and if you don't, uh, if you don't uh, affirm climate change, you're a climate denier. That means you hate poor people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I do know. I do know that. I do know that it's worse than denying the Holocaust. I think they're thinking of passing laws against Holocaust, against uh, climate change deniers climate in the same denier, countries, yeah. Yeah. where they have um, Holocaust denier laws in effect. So yeah. one one is we'll about denying something that, that happened in the past. Name that if you. Uh, We'll have to name the fallacy that if you don't ag agree with our position, we're going to throw you in jail. That's an appeal to appeal to force fallacy, isn't it? Uh, that would be that's uh, a real appeal to authority, isn't it? <laughs> that would be uh, the 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 ad baculum fallacy. I take it right. That's right. Uh, appeal, to, appeal to force. Yeah, yeah, okay. and appeal to uh, to the to the uh, to the masses. 
and stuff. So uh, now another fallacy that that I think is common is the argument of the beard. Um, and I actually I actually hear Christians com commit this fallacy as much as as anybody else. It's a very handy way to seemingly stump your opponent. And the idea uh, is is you, you have a screen fallacy. That, just, don't you? Oh, let me show you my, my uh, screenshot sure, yeah, here. Sure, why right, not? Me, yeah, since we're talking about the fallacy of the beard, let's talk about one of the most fallacious beards anyone has ever seen. <laughs> so, yeah, there, Actually, there, it's a very, there, there you go. Like have, very, uh, have, <laughs> so there, there is a uh, fallacy of the beard right there, but uh, for a different reason, perhaps. Uh, uh, so, anyway. I love but, it. Uh, what, what, I want to grow, grow in just like it. What uh, what the fallacy actually says is that it, it's illicit. The fallacy says that because you can't tell the difference uh, 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 between uh, where you uh, let me start over. Because you can't tell me where to draw the line, then you can't tell the difference between the extremes on a line. So the main fallacy of the beard comes from the fact that suppose someone said, "Well, how many whiskers must a man have on his face before you can say he has a beard?" And I would venture to guess, no one could give you the exact number of whiskers that would say right then that now you have a beard with this number. Well, But even though I can't draw the line, it doesn't mean I can't tell the difference between a clean-shaven man and a fully bearded man. So I can, even if I can't draw a line in the, in the middle. And so, well, and people will do this uh, with moral issues. You know, well, who are you to say that Marilyn Manson is, you know, is bad music? Because after all, you know, Dan Fogelberg has a few uh, you know, racy lyrics. You go, okay, well, if you can't tell the difference between Marilyn Manson and Dan Fogelberg, or pick your favorite extreme. <laughs> well, what about, what about, uh, well, who are you to say that Joseph Stalin was evil? I mean, even, even Mr. Rogers had his bad days. You go, well, sure, I, I can't draw the line between. <laughs> You know, how many bad things must a person do before he's more of a Stalin than a Mr. Rogers? But it doesn't mean I can't tell the difference between the extremes uh, of the two. And to, and to insist that I have to draw a line is just a fallacy of the beard uh, when the thing we're talking about falls along a continuum. Well, well it's, it's the insistence that you, you can't draw a line, right? It, that there's, there's, there's no way to really make the distinction. Absolutely. Is, is and it's just the opposite yeah. of the false dilemma fallacy. It's the opposite we, we, of false dilemma. Okay, so this reminds me of a of a court decision that I used to hear a lot about back in the '70s, where the um, the, the 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 one uh, one lawyers were arguing that you really shouldn't you really shouldn't uh, uh, stigmatize pornography because there was a lot of art that had nudes. You know, you even have uh, you even have famous paintings that dealt with the theme of rape, and therefore you, you can't um, make this distinction that some of it's pornographic. And the response of the judge, which seems seemed to have established a precedent at the time, was, I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see it. So he was saying it's, it's really easy to spot. He couldn't come up with a precise definition that distinguished it from these great works of art because they all involve nudity, they all involve questionable themes, but uh, he knew it when he saw it. Uh, I don't know if that still is a, a standing well, no, precedent. It, no, it is. It, there, there's, there, it also goes by the name of the centipede fallacy, and it's trying to insist that, well, because a centipede has so many legs, he couldn't possibly manage and think about moving each one, therefore he's not able to walk. And you go, just because <laughs> I can't give you a uh, specific things that are the the uh, clear-cut criteria for it being pornographic it doesn't follow that again I don't know it when I see it and I think the judge is exactly right in fact uh, it, you know philosophers I mean I would defy people to try to define most functional objects I mean what is a chair I mean you could get into all kinds of arguments well to how many legs does it have to have what kind of material must it be made out of does it have to have a back you could you could you could insist that, well, gee, there's so many different ways a chair can be, then who's to say what defines a chair specifically? Well, even if that was the case, it doesn't mean we don't know a chair when we see one, and we can't tell the difference <laughs> between a chair and a love seat and a sofa. And, and so trying to, get, trying to get people hung up in all of these fuzzy areas of, of life, 
in order to prevent us from making clear-cut propositions is just is just a fallacy. It's just not the way we so think. So somebody somebody points to a rock and says, "Here, have a seat on this chair." Uh, they they might have already subscribed to the fallacy. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. Now the false dilemma I mentioned a while ago. False dilemma is tries to. Uh, say that there are only the extremes and there's nothing in the middle uh, when in fact there may be a, a, a something in the middle so a dilemma is when you give someone a choice between two things both of which are probably undesirable like well you can keep your you can keep suffering with a toothache or you can go get a root canal okay well I don't want to do either one of those but I got to do one or the other so I'm in a dilemma and that's a true dilemma you're either not going to get the root canal or you are but uh, <laughs> There are other dilemmas that aren't necessarily false dilemmas. You know, you can either have the cake or the or the or the ice cream. Well, maybe I could have cake and ice cream both, perhaps. I mean, logically speaking. So when you deny that there are third alternatives, it's either it's either this or that. When there are in fact more alternatives in an in an argument, that's a that's a false dilemma. So so if I were to ask my grandson, would you rather walk to school or carry your lunch? That would be a false dilemma. Potentially, <laughs> or would you rather would you rather uh, uh, vote for Hillary or have a nuclear war? Uh, with well, uh, see, this is this is great because this <laughs> that's a that's a great that's exactly the kind of stuff that happens, isn't it? You see it in theology when people say, "Well, you know, we can't we we should just retire our debate over the inerrancy of Scripture because after all, we're not going to totally agree on everything." You go, "Well, wait a minute, it isn't." the choice between we either totally agree on everything or we uh, retire our debate on inerrancy. Maybe we can still have the debate on inerrancy and still not agree on everything. That's a false, you know, that's we, a false we, dilemma. We, we, we had that with Bill Gothard. As you, you, you know, we wrote our book on Bill Gothard. Uh, after the book came out, we had about, I don't know, six weeks of meeting with him every Monday. It was Mondays with Bill just to talk about grace. And, and uh, Ron and I continually made the case to him that his view is Roman Catholic in origin. We made the case repeatedly. We demonstrated from Roman Catholic documents verbatim what he was teaching, at the, and he kept arguing that it wasn't. And at the end of six weeks, his response was, the Catholics aren't wrong on everything, which is true, <laughs> but it doesn't mean they're right on this definition of grace. Well, what, That's what exactly really, right. What, what really got me about that, this is what really sticks in my craw to this day, is that uh, I was quoting from J.I. Packer as a source, and finally I just threw my hands up in the air and said, go talk to Packer you know, about this. He wrote the stuff that I'm quoting. So he did. Uh, he told J.I. Packer that we were arguing that God's grace has no power. Remember that, Don? I, yeah, I, I can do. pull it up. Yeah, and, and, other, and that was not what we were arguing at all. He totally misrepresented our argument. But anyways, uh, uh, let's talk about some informal fallacies. It's a straw that, man fallacy, by the way. That's called oh, a straw yeah. man fallacy, by the yeah, way. Yeah, he totally missed That's a straw man fallacy. I, mm -hmm. We were not arguing that. We were, we were not arguing that God's grace has no power. We were arguing that it can't be defined merely as power. So if you, well, he would say the, po the desire and the power to, to do God's will joyfully. God. So, so let's take that mm -hmm. definition out. Let's take that definition and substitute it for the word grace in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by the desire and power to obey God, you are saved, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works. Well, wait a minute. You just said it's by the desire and power to obey God that you're saved. That sounds like works to me. <laughs> so you've basically created an, an, an internal contradiction right in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 which he was unable to see. Um, let's talk right. about fun fun fallacies. That, those are the really good ones. Um, one day I was in a youth group meeting with um, my good friend uh, Ted Griffin, who was our youth group leader. He was an editor at Crossway Books when he retired. And um, our, 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 the, the youth guy from our church, we were meeting two separate churches together. My name is Chuck. He passed away recently. And Ted says to Chuck, Hey, Chuck, when did you stop beating your wife? Uh, which fallacy did he just commit? <laughs> well, it, it depends if he actually did stop beating his wife or not. Uh, it's called the uh, fallacy of the it's called the fallacy of the complex question. 
because it's actually yeah. asking two questions at the same time, insisting that the person give a single answer to both questions, so, the single which, same answer to both questions simultaneously. Which two questions was he asking? He when was did asking, you stop beating your wife? That's right. He was at, you know, he was, he was, he was more or less just saying, "Are you beating your wife?" And then, if so, uh, are you still beating your wife? And have you stopped? Something like that depends on how you parse them out. So, for him to give a single answer, "When did you stop?" is to tacitly grant the assumption that he was beating the wife, but did not didn't ask him explicitly, "Are you beating your wife, uh, or not, or have you ever?" And he says, "Well, yes or yes or no." So it's it's called a complex question because it's 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 taking assumptions that are not in evidence. You know, it's just it's, it's it's making assumptions that are themselves open to question. So, am I turning it around somewhat when I say that no major league hitter has ever hit one of my pitches? Is that uh, what kind of fallacy? <laughs> that that's great. I think about that one. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, you know, it sounds uh, like an, uh, a loaded answer and, instead of a loaded. And there's question. no no NFL receiver that's ever dropped one of my passes. <laughs> exactly. Same, same kind of deal. Yeah. I think we should have fun with that. I've, I've, I've never missed. A... I've never missed a pass that uh, Brett Favre threw to me, or whatever. Yeah. You know, or whoever you want. A cut low, cut low, or whoever you want to do. <laughs> so, uh, well, we have lots of fallacies. I mean, um, how about the, uh, the uh, here's one that happens a lot against us as Christians, and that is the accusation, the, the incorrect accusation, that we sometimes are committing what is called the fallacy of composition. When we make a cosmological argument that everything in the universe is caused, therefore the universe has a cause. So a very common response to that from the atheist is, well, the Christian is committing the fallacy of composition. You know, and, the, and the fallacy of composition, there is a such thing. That's when you illicitly apply the characteristics of the parts of things to the whole of the thing. For example, suppose you said, uh, well, if each square on the tile is, uh, each t uh, tile on the floor is square, then the floor is square. Well, that doesn't follow because you can have a rectangular floor made up of square tiles. So the squareness of the tiles doesn't accrue to the squareness of the floor made out of the tiles. And when a person insists that it ought to, that's a fallacy of composition. But the comeback to the atheist is, but not every composition is a fallacy. Because if every tile, let's say, was green, then the floor would be green. See, so you wouldn't say, well, if you put all these square tiles on the, I mean, all these green tiles in this floor, you're going to have a green floor. It would be ludicrous for somebody to go, oh, that's a fallacy of composition. Just because the tiles are green doesn't mean the floor is going to be green. Yes. If the tiles are green, the floor is going to be green. If the tiles are concrete, the floor is going to be green. Yeah. So the, the trick is, it, is, is to say, okay, so when I say if everything is caused, in the universe is caused, therefore the universe is caused, is the cause more like the square of the tile or is it more like the green of the tile? And now the atheist is on the hook to defend why he thinks it's more like the square and the theist is on the hook as to why he thinks it's more like the green. But at least there's a legitimate composition that's not a fallacy. Well, and, and, and we also have to be a little careful because when we say everything in the universe uh, is created, we needed to make an exclusionary statement in there. Otherwise, we've got to find out who created God, right? Except so anything that God's not in the universe. Well, anything that came to... well. Uh, if I was an atheist, I would say, well, don't you believe that God is everywhere present? Of course. Well, is he in the universe? Yeah, but he's of not course. in the universe. I would just deny that. I'd say he's not in the universe. That's just a, that's a, that's another fallacy called a category mistake. Aha! Uh -huh. okay, it's like saying go. what category mistake would be a more easy example to see. A category mistake would be like saying what time is it on the sun? Or how much does blue weigh? Uh, you're, you're listening, so to say, is God in the universe or not? So that's a, that's a category mistake. But see, in is a spatial, um, in is a spatial reference, and God's not a spatial being. But isn't that? Aren't we starting to push the borders now of how much logic and uh, and deductive reasoning can tell us about God? I mean, it is. Uh, we know God is not in the universe because of what He's revealed to us that He created it. 
So in other words, some things we know by revelation. But see, but I think that's true. That's that's knowable from creation itself, as Romans one uh, yes. one uh, twenty says that the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen through the things that are made. So I, I, what, even apart from special revelation, we can know that God is not in the universe. But that would be more of a philosophical argument to that effect. Yeah, well, it's, so it's a revelation. It's it's direct revelation to every human being on the planet. Um, and it's, Via the creation, right? right. Yeah. Well, it's not. It, yeah, it's uh, it's direct. It's revelation. It's God revealing truths about Himself through the things that He's made. It's reasoning right. from effect to cause. So the um, uh, yeah, I guess I guess you could make an argument though that. Um, Paul might be saying, and people have made this argument, he has made it evident within them. Uh, the, uh, in other words, there's at some level, it's it's it moves from the logical realm to the intuitive realm that we just know. It's not based on intellect. It's not based on your ability to reason it through. Now, there's you can you can you can translate that phrase. God made it. Uh, God revealed it among them instead of within them. It's a possible change in translation. I don't know if anybody who does that, but in any case, uh, yeah, I, I think I we're basically on the same page when it comes to that. Um, the um, I was looking for um, the fallacy of composition. My little book here. The uh, it seems like with that. With regard to the cause issue, you have three choices. You can either say the universe is created, that was that had a cause that was divine. Uh, you have the universe is uh, uncreated; it's uncaused completely. Or what I think Plato was trying to avoid that there's an infinite regression of causes. Since everything is caused, I think he assumed that you can't just keep going back. Or was this an Aquinas argument? I forget. Uh, maybe both, that everything that we know that exists was caused by something else, therefore it had to be caused, everything before it had to be caused by something else. So he avoided the infinite regression of causes, which to him was absurd, by saying that it was caused by the the maker, the, the, the person who made it originally. Um, yes. So is it, does it boil down to, from your perspective, Finding the argument that is the least absurd, the most defensible, that makes the most sense, or, or how does it work for you? Well, uh, you know what I've what I've experienced is that there are arguments, particularly things like uh, existence of God, where they they uh, they deal with a minimal amount of controversial assumptions, and then argue and point towards God. But then, in order to identify that God as being the God of classical theism. Then you have to do the heavy lifting to shore up the argument, or you can just reverse the order and do the proper metaphysics at the beginning, and then once you get the argument out, the conclusion is the god of classical metaphysics. So at some point, you know the the least least the number of assumptions at the front end creates the objections. Well, who created the creator or who designed the designer? And so you got to keep bolstering the argument to, to fend off those objections. But if a person does the heavy lifting at the beginning and sets forth, let's say, a classical argument from classical theism that, say, like an Aquinas would give, then the, 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 the objections who created the creator would be absurd. Okay. Would this be, uh, would Occam's razor come into play with this? And if so, m might you explain what that is to those who are watching? Well, uh, this could actually be uh, a potential sponsor for future uh, yes, yes. future shows because <laughs> well, we I, I'm lobbying offer, for <laughs> we, we need to offer it along with Occam's shaving cream, I think, yes, don't exactly. you? <laughs> now, I, uh, I used to argue uh, that, that I have Occam's soap on a rope. Actually, I have a picture of <laughs> Occam's I have a picture of Occam's toothbrush. It only has one bristle on it. <laughs> <laughs> you can use it for dental floss too. Yeah. Why, so, why only, oh, is the simplest possible. Yeah, person. well, yeah, well, Occam's <laughs> razor basically says that you shouldn't multiply causes beyond necessity. So it isn't so much the simpler, the uh, the simpler position is more likely to be true. Because if that was the case, we should all be solipsists, since being. A solipsist is the person who believes he's the only thing that exists and everything else is in his mind. Well, technically, that would be the simplest explanation of everything because it only has one item in it. 
but no one opts for solipsism on the basis of Occam's razor. So it isn't it isn't particularly simpler is better. It's don't multiply causes beyond what is necessary to account for the data. That's what Occam's razor uh, is for, or, or is pointing at. Okay. So okay. Um, well, we are going to do more of this now, Richard. If uh, if we have someone out there who's going, you know, I'm a little interested in learning more about this, but I need sort of a beginner's um, uh, book or booklet on uh, logical fallacies. Is there something you would recommend other than there is one? Uh, there's a couple of things I would recommend. First of all, the uh, uh, let me let me show you this. Let me share this right quick. I'll just let you see this this picture. Uh, this here is um, uh, A.J. Hoover wrote a book titled Don't You Believe It? It's a, if you just Google that, you should be able to find it free on the Internet, the PDF uh, of the book. And so it's a great, handy cataloging of informal fallacies that I, I think is, uh, is, uh, uh, is tremendous. I, I also would encourage people to, uh, to go to uh, my website here. Let me just pull that up. So if you go to richardghow.com uh, there, and then you follow the resources right at the top there, you see that little uh, resources there blinking, and then you go to this page that gives you four options. You go to PDF decks, and then the PDF of, of uh, the presentation that I do on this, you'll just find it's called Exposing Logical Fallacies. So you can just download, and it just has uh, explanations and illustrations, and and even the beard guy that you saw earlier is in there. So I invite people to go to richardghow.com and, and and get that uh, material uh, uh, for free. Perfect. That's good. All right, Ron, uh, you want to kind of talk us out of here for the week, and then uh, uh, next week uh, it looks like we're talking about, I don't know what we're talking about, something. Um, Oh yes, uh, um, the evolution of some of the festivals, like the Burning Man Festival, we're talking about next week. Yeah, we usually do have a topic. This one might, yeah. All right, Burning Man next week. Wow. Yeah. All righty. Yeah. Well, let's make our way out of here. Before we do, we have to have another word from World's End Theology Outlet. You know, we've all been there. We've all had the problem of having that. Uh, pesky evangelical neighbor who has the Bible memorized, has an answer for everything. Are you tired of losing arguments to that guy? Is living next door to him kind of like living next to a clone of Ravi Zacharias? Well, we've got something for you. It's called the Bible Contradiction Finder, and here's how it works. Let's say that you are having a discussion with your Christian friend next door, and he pulls out his Bible uh, what you need to do is you need to flip it over to a particular place. Let's just say you flip it over to Psalm 14, and you're going to tell him, I found a place in the Bible where there's a contradiction. And he says, really? Where? At that point is when you say, is that Ravi Zacharias walking down the street? When he looks up, you put down the Bible contradiction finder. And when he looks back, you say, now look closely at what the Bible says. And, of course, when he does, he will say, it says right there, there is no God. This is because the Bible Contradiction Finder comes with our own unique patented context-blocking technology. Yes, you can start winning arguments against that pesky Christian neighbor of yours with the Bible Contradiction Finder. It is available only through World's End Theology Outlet because no one else would sell it. Okay, well, what, um, what next, Don? Next week it's well, uh, roll roll the credits and we will then say goodbye to everybody. Okay, well let's just do that then. Uh, Don always has a way of talking me into things here. Okay, so um, our uh, resident cult leader profiler here at the Unknown Webcast is Neil before me. Our Jehovah's Witnesses coverage is handled by Arme Geddon and D Opposer. Our Mormon Archives manager is Polly Gummis. Our Liberal Denominations Bureau is headed up by Lucy Goosey. Transgender issues coverage is handled by Ben Hur. Fact-checking supervisor, Yoleg Pulling. Our technical assistance comes through Murky Research. Our legal advisors are at the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. Our grievance resolutions director is Yovana Pisami. 
Our director of privacy assurance is wiretapping. Our original idea sourcing comes from Drew A. Blank. The Unknown Webcast is a production of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc., which is solely responsible for its content, but you will never be able to prove that in court. All right. Can't wait till next week. With that, uh, it logically follows that we are going to be ending for tonight, but we will resume again next week, and we will have Richard back on a future webcast on something uh, indeterminate at this time, but it will be fun, I am sure. So, he, of course, uh, he wants to, wants to be associated with our distinguished webcast, I understand. Uh, yes. He is stuck with us anyway, whether he likes it or not. All right. I'm and with that, adios.